So good morning, everyone. I am Missy Lindsay with the Southern U.S. Trade Association, SUSTA. I am the Senior Marketing Coordinator here at SUSTA, and we thank you all for participating. Uh, before we get started, just want to talk about a few housekeeping rules. Um, please mute all of your uh, computers, phones, or laptops. Um, and then also keep in mind that after we have the presentations from each of the speakers, that we will open up the forum for Q&A. So please feel free to drop a question in that chat box, and we will definitely get to it towards the end of the uh, webinar. So thank you all for joining us today. We're super excited to have you. I'm going to get started uh, with talking about SUSTA. Um, I know we have a lot of companies that are seasoned vets on this call, so welcome back. I'm not going to dive too deep into the program areas, but I am going to um, talk about just some of the guidelines that we're still um, responsible for making sure you guys stick to and adhere to. you. Um, and that is going to be that your products are grown in the US, you know, having those 50% ingredients that are grown in the United States, and then also somewhere visible in your packaging and labeling, having that made in USA origin statement uh, that's separate from your address. And then also you wanna make sure that you're representing a specific brand and you're located within our headquarters. Um, a lot of these uh, eligible requirements seem very familiar to you all, but if you have any questions about them, you can always give us a call and we can talk about what um, are the qualifications to make sure that you're eligible and still fall within those categories. Um, great new things that we've added to SUSTA uh, this past year. We've had a lot of free webinars, which you all have participated in in the past, um, but we also have export readiness training. Uh, we do offer that opportunity for companies to come to our um, office or to virtually have an export readiness training to talk about how we can make sure you're ready to get into those international markets. And brand new in 2021, we're super excited to launch our export helpline. Uh, we do have Victoria here with us today. She is the contact once you ask that question online that you can find on our website, she would uh, be able to answer any questions you have to try to guide you assistance on, on what export advice or tools or um, certificates you may need to get into certain markets. So please feel free to utilize that ex export um, helpline when you get a moment. And then also we've always had game reports featured on our website. Uh, they can be found underneath the resource pages um, of the SUSTA site. I always say if you're looking for a particular market to go to or finding the stats from previous years of how U.S. exports have done in international markets, uh, you can always pull up the game reports that are free to uh, gain access to on our website. I'm uh, going to talk briefly about our program areas. Of course, you all know we have our global events program area and then our 50% cost share. Uh, fifth, uh, global events this year, we've added a few new things to it. Uh, so we still have our traditional inbound trade missions. Uh, where companies can meet one-on-one -on -one with our uh, foreign market buyers that come into the United States. And then we also have our outbound trade missions where we take you to those international markets to have those one-on-one -on -one meetings. And a lot of times those uh, tours involve retail visits or site tours. So you can see how your competitors are doing and what can make you a little bit more marketable in those international regions. And then lastly, we still have international trade shows available through the global events program area as well. So we have um, a pavilion area that we set up in the USA section of an international show, and we offer those booth spaces to our companies within the SUSTA pavilion, a lot of times at a reduced cost. Keep in mind, it is a turnkey process. So included in your registration fee, as some of you know, will be your booth, your furnishing, shipping your product samples. A lot of times we do have interpreter service there's services there as well to better help you network with the buyers that are attending. Um, and, you know, again, the beneficial thing about any one of these global events is that we always have activity managers there to assist you um, that come from our member states with the Department of Agriculture. So they are a great help to us as well. And they are happy to assist companies and the partnership that we have with them is very important to us to kind of assist all of our states and our um, companies. 
And then lastly, what we've added this year, we added a little bit towards the end of 2020, but we kept it going in 2021. Uh, we do have free consultations with our foreign market consultants. So if there is a particular country market that you're interested in finding out more about, you can always set up a free consultation with them on that events page of the SESTA site as well. I'd highly recommend it, especially if it's a new market that you're trying to find out more about. Um, again, our events can always be found on the events page of the SESTA site. We are constantly updating them and adding it, um, adding new events and taking some away. Keep in mind that it is uh, during the time of COVID, so things are fluctuating here and there. I do know sometimes we have pivoted into having virtual trade missions if an inbound or an outbound mission has been uh, canceled or postponed. So feel free to contact our office if you have any questions regarding our global events department. And then now we're going to talk briefly about cost share. Um, as so many of you know, this is where you can get that 50% reimbursement to promote your products internationally. Um, typically, we used to have companies come in when travel was more rampant and um, international trade shows were happening more often to come in to get reimbursed 50% for the cost of their booths, travel for uh, two people in your company to travel to exhibit at these trade shows, which included flights, hotel, and per diem. Uh, but now we find that with limited travel, things like advertising, website development, your traditional pack packaging and labeling, you know, if you have to get that packaging labeling converted to a foreign language as a requirement uh, to get your products in these international markets, these are the type of things that we can help reimburse with through cost share. Um, I am finding that during COVID uh, and during I would say during COVID, but I would also say that this was a trend that was probably eventually going to take off anyway. Um, but it's ramped up a little bit more. We have, you know, a lot of companies are utilizing digital advertising or digital marketing to get their products into certain markets. Uh, you know, any form on here that you see is reimbursable through cost share. A lot of companies are also starting to utilize that Google search engine. Um, I always give the example of if I were looking for soup anywhere in the world, I guarantee you that Campbell's soup would come up first. Um, I don't care if I was in the desert, I could find Campbell's soup. Um, so theoretically, that could apply to companies as well. If you are promoting your products, let's say in Canada, if you have wine or spirits and you want your product to come up as the top winery or vineyard in Virginia, um, then if somebody searched that in the Google engine, that would be a cost to you, correct? But that's something that we could reimburse 50% for through the cost share program area. Um, keep in mind that a lot of other forms of digital advertising are reimbursable as well. For instance, hiring an influencer as they like to be called now, content creators um, are also reimbursable through cost share if you're promoting through that international market. Um, you know, just also remember if you have a virtual uh, trade show that's taking place, I do know that we had a few virtual trade shows in the US that were on that US approved trade show list. Um, so I believe Expo West had a virtual component that just ended. And a lot of times I don't think companies realize how costly the virtual shows can be. For instance, that show was $1,900. So if a company were to exhibit um, at a virtual trade show, they could get that reimbursement. So 50% of that could have been reimbursed back to them to promote their products without leaving their home or their, um, their company. Again, this is a cost for cost share. So there is a $250 non-refundable application fee that companies must pay to SESTA annually. Um, and we can talk a little bit about a little bit more about that in depth if you have any questions. Um, just remember with cost share that you want to make sure that you apply and that you're approved prior to conducting the activity. So we can make sure that you meet all of the qualifications and you fill out everything in your application correctly. Uh, Deneen Wilkes, our cost share director, would be happy to assist you with any questions you have regarding filling out your application. And outside of that, if you have additional questions regarding or general questions regarding cost share, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. For the global event side, I do have my colleague, Alistair Perez, who can answer any specific questions regarding an event that you may be interested in. Uh, please feel free to contact us at any moment. We'd be happy to assist. I'm gonna now, I talked fast, so I can hopefully get a little bit more time in for the logistics webinar. Um, but now I'm gonna turn it over to Heidi Kim, who is with our 
Gal. She has been a great resource for SESTA and our companies with helping us find um, international buyers for our companies to meet, I would say for over a decade, if I'm not mistaken. So she's very knowledgeable and she is going to introduce our two speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Missy. And uh, thank you everybody for joining our webinar today. Um, I recognize uh, many people that are on the participant list right now, but in case you don't uh, know who I am, I, my name is Heidi Kim and I am one of the Canadian in-country consultants for SESTA um, at Argyle in Canada. Uh, we've been uh, the Canadian and country consultant for SESTA since 2010 and have worked with a wide range of industries ranging from value added products, beer, wine and spirits to seafood, horticulture and produce. Um, in a normal year, we would have done probably at least one event in uh, four or five of the industries that I just mentioned, but of course, you know, with COVID, we've had to pivot and a lot of our um, activities have gone virtual and some of these um, uh, industries were not as um, keen on virtual events. But um, in the meantime, if you have any uh, questions about the Canadian market or would like to um, just see if your product is a good fit for Canada, uh, we would be happy to um, talk to you via our virtual consultation services that Missy introduced as well. So please sign up for that program. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our two guest speakers uh, today. Uh, Gloria Terhar is a trade compliance supervisor and regulatory compliance specialty, a specialist at PCB. Uh, with over 17 years of experience in the industry, Gloria is often called upon to train the industry as well. Uh, she's also participated in the Canadian Produce Marketing Association and the Canadian Horticulture Council advocacy event to help promote advocacy efforts for the industry. Chelsea Teal is the supervisor for ground shipments at PCB. Uh, she has extensive knowledge of the ground transportation solutions and logistics. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from Gloria and Chelsea today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you. Oh, Gloria, unmute. There we go. Thank you very much, Heidi. And I'm just gonna dive right into this presentation because we have a lot of information to cover. I'm gonna go over some do basic documentation requirements as well as uh, product specific requirements and um, some information about e-commerce and samples in the presentation. So first I'm gonna review the different parties that are involved in the customs transaction. Um, it's important to understand that there are different parties with different responsibilities. The first party is the Canada Border Services Agency known as the CBSA. They're responsible for the safety and security of Canada's borders, the collection of duties and taxes, as well as enforcement actions such as seizures and audits. Next, we have the customs broker, which is what I am. Um, we're responsible for making the declaration to the Canada Border Services Agency and any other participating government agencies who regulate the goods. We assist with the calculation of and collection of duties and taxes, as well as um, education, such as events like this, and teaching our importers, our clients, what they need to know in order to import their goods into Canada. Next, we have the carrier. They're the party that is um, responsible for transporting the goods from point A to point B. Chelsea will go over more information about carriers later in the presentation. Then we have the consignee. They're the party who is responsible for receiving the goods. The shipper, they are the party who will physically prepare the goods for shipping to the final destination. We have the seller. Um, the seller may also be known as the vendor. They're the party selling the goods to the buyer in Canada. They may be the same as the shipper or they may be, have a separate shipper that they work with. Next, we have PGA, which is Participating Government Agency. We have nine government agencies that regulate the, good, the importation of goods into Canada. Um, and I will touch base on their requirements throughout the presentation. In the center of our circle, we have the importer of record. They're the party that is ultimately, ultimately responsible for the importation of goods into Canada, the compliance with all regulations and the payments of duties and taxes. 
In Canada, we also recognize non-resident importers. Um, they, a non-resident is a business located outside of Canada that ships goods to Canada and elects to assume the responsibility for the customs clearance and all other imported import related requirements, meaning that they have all of the same responsibilities as a resident importer and they're subject to all of the same laws. Um, a non-resident importer is required to register with the Canada Border Services Agency and obtain um, a Canadian business number uh, and an import extension called an RM. Uh, literally, that's what it's called. <laughs> and they also have to obtain authorization to maintain records outside of Canada. For companies in the United States, that's quite easy. The, um, the Canada Border Services Agency will almost always authorize you um, to maintain your records at a location outside of Canada. But if for some reason they do deny you, you'll have to find a company in Canada who's willing to store your records physically on their premise. Um, someone like your customs broker might be able to do that for you. Depending on your business size, you may also have to register with the Canada Revenue Agency, and that can involve things like filing corporate taxes in Canada and paying the GST, the goods and services tax. And again, you have responsibilities for ensuring the import declaration is accurate. You're responsible for all compliance with acts and regulations, the payments of duties and taxes and audits and penalties. Next, this is a sample of a Canada, Canada Customs Invoice. The Canada Border Services Agency has minimum data requirements that's required on an invoice, and they made up a Canada Customs Invoice for importers to use. Um, that invoice, when the Canada Customs Invoice, when completed in full, has all of the required data elements needed to make a customs declaration. Um, it's not actually mandatory though, so if you're using your own commercial invoice, that's fine, but make sure it has all of the same data elements. Some of the information that's commonly missing off of a sales invoice or commercial invoice is the country of origin of the goods, so the place where the goods are produced, manufactured, or grown, not where they're shipped from, the currency, and sometimes the complete description of the goods. When you're shipping, um, especially food products or plants and produce, you need to ensure that you have a complete detailed description. And for plants, produce, and fish, make sure the scientific name is there because there's a lot of lookalike species and you don't want to have um, your item mistaken for something else. Um, also make sure the importer of record is clearly marked. If you're electing to act as a non-resident importer, this is very important because the vast majority of importers are Canadian resident companies. And so it's quite common for a carrier to go, oh, the importer is the people I'm delivering it to. And then the documents um, get given to the wrong customs broker. So just make sure there's a clear notation importer record is and put that on your documents. Next, we have our NAFTA 2.0, the new um, uh, uh, USMCA or CUSMA agreement. Um, we call it Kuzma in Canada for short. The Kuzma replaced NAFTA last year, and it has, instead of a certification form, uh, minimum data elements are required. Right now, I'm showing you a sample of the form that we made for anybody to use. It's on our website. And when it's completed in full, it has all of the required data elements plus an extra one. Um, the country of origin field isn't actually mandatory, but it's extremely handy to have on that document. Um, and when it's completed in full, it meets the requirements of the free trade agreement. So those minimum data elements are, is identifying who the certifier is. Is it the importer, exporter, or producer of the goods? All three parties can complete the certification and you have to include their details. So their company name, address, phone number, email. Next, you have fields for the exporter, producer, and importer. Um, if known, complete that information. Um, if it's not known, it's ideal to enter in the field, one of those fields unknown, because um, Canada Border Services Agency has said that they'd like to see that. So they know that the field has been acknowledged and completed versus accidentally omitted in error. Next, we have the HS tariff description, HS tariff and description of the goods. So that's the harmonized tariff system to the first six digits and a complete description of the goods that enables me to link this particular document to the sales invoice for the shipment. Then there is an origin criteria. 
This isn't the country of origin of the goods or where the goods ship from. This is how the goods meet the rules of origin of the free trade agreement. Rules of origin tell, um, rules of origin are written into free trade agreements to make sure that a product undergoes sufficient production in the country of manufacture to actually be considered made in the USA. So for example, if you imported something from a country offshore and then you simply repackaged it, that's not going to be enough of a substantial transformation. However, if you imported potatoes from Canada, turned them into, well, actually that's a really bad example because we're in the same free trade agreement. Um, if you imported um, potatoes from another country that's not a member of the free trade agreement and turn them into potato or potato chips, that's likely enough of a substantial transformation to meet the requirements of the trade agreement. Next, there is a blanket period. Um, this field is not mandatory. The certification can be completed for a single shipment. And if that's the case, this field can be left blank. Um, if you're completing it and intend to reuse the certificate, um, it can be reused for multiple shipments for a period of up to one year. So you need to fill out the blanket period that it's valid for, for to a maximum of 12 months. And lastly, there is the authorized signature and certifying statement. The certifying statement is one of the most important parts of this um, certification because it's the statement that certifies that or says that the certifier guarantees that the products qualify as originating under the rules of origin of the free trade agreement and that they'll be able to prove it upon request of the government agencies. You will, as I said, there's no um, required format for this document, so you will see um, a lot of different formats for it. As long as they have the right data elements in the certification, they would all be considered valid. Next, I have a sample of a very commonly seen document for exporting plants and produce to Canada. It's one of the versions of the USDA phytosanitary certificate. Um, the USDA is your plant protection organization, and they've worked with the CFIA to confirm uh, pest risks and what needs to be done to ensure that plants and produce entering Canada don't have any pests with them. And they will certify that the product is, meets the conditions of Canada and is free of those pests. The original must travel with the shipment and the importer into Canada must surrender that original within 14 days of the customs release. So now I'm gonna quickly talk about the Canadian Safe Foods for Canadians regulations. In order to import food into Canada, um, the importer of record has to be licensed by the, safe, by the CFIA under the Safe Foods for Canadians reg regulations. The license itself is literally a license to import and it's valid for two years and applications are made online in the My CFIA portal. Um, importers can elect to have one license or multiple licenses. The licensing regulations themselves have components and requirements such as preventative controls or a written preventative control plan, traceability, and recalls. Another component of the license is that the food must ship directly from the foreign country in which the license holder carries on business if you are a non-resident importer. This is so that uh, the CFIA knows that you have been able to ensure the safety of that food. In other words, you can't be a non-resident importer in the US and have a product shipped directly from Germany into Canada because you don't have control over that food. And then we have organic products. Um, Canada enforces an organic regime that states the importer must be in possession of the organic certificate for any products that are certified organic. Products that are certified organic must be certified by an accredited agency and the US and Canada do have an organic equivalency, arrange, equivalency arrangement where products that are certified organic in the US by uh, US accredited agencies are recognized in Canada. And so it makes it quite easy for you to ship your organic products. Just make sure that you have your certification available for the Canadian importer to get a copy of it. Now I'm going to start into some of the product, more uh, specific product requirements. So first, fish and shellfish. Um, we need to have the species or the taxonomic serial number of the fish in order to declare it properly to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Also, we need to know what state it's in. Is it fresh? Is it whole? Is it raw or cooked? 
all of these um, in all of these pieces of information, in addition to the country of origin um, where of the fish or shellfish, ties into the import requirements. Um, fish uh, can carry some various aquatic animal diseases in the head and the guts. So depending on the state, the, you, the import of the, the shipment may require a zoo sanitary certificate to state that the fish doesn't have any of those diseases. And the importer may require a CFIA issued import permit. Um, one note about the import permits is that they cannot be issued to non-resident importers because you're not in control of the fish when it enters when you, it enters Canada. Next, we have meat. Meat is anything that comes from a terrestrial animal, so like beef, poultry, pork. And all meat entering Canada is controlled by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency under the Health of Animals regulations, as well as the Safe Foods for Canadians regulations. If the products, for the vast majority of products, if they contain more than 2% meat content, they'll require an official meat inspection certificate, and the importer will have to arrange reinspection at a certified reinspection facility. And for some products containing less than 2% meat content, the importer will need a calculation to prove it. And there's two documents that can be used, a Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition uh, certificate, or again, an original meat inspection certificate. Now let's look at produce. I know I'm going really fast here, but we have a lot of stuff to cover and we have um, very not, we have oh, just a little bit of time. So produce entering Canada has standardized container sizing and labeling requirements. Um, the grade as well as grade requirements. Grade is to ensure the quality of the um, product entering Canada and the, the USDA is quite familiar with the Canadian grades. So for example, potatoes need to be grade number, Canada grade number one, and apples need to be Canada extra fancy or Canada fancy. Um, they also have standardized packaging requirements uh, for apples, peaches, apricots, and pears. The maximum packaging size is 200 kilos. And for most other fruits and vegetables, the maximum packaging size is 50 kilos. This doesn't mean you have to package your fruits and vegetables in those sizes in order to send them to Canada. It just means you don't wanna package them in sizes bigger than that because that will change the import requirements. If, because they're, if they are in packages higher than the standardized packaging size, the importer will be able to, will be required to apply for a ministerial exemption, exempting them from the packaging sizes. Fresh produce also has a lot of specific import requirements due to those grades, as well as pest requirements. These are some samples of some of the requirements. The US is so vast that I can't go over the requirements for every single state for all of the different produce because it's all species based as well. Different pests attack different species. So, but here's some examples. Apples, onions, and potatoes all need an FV205 or an SC205 issued by the USDA to ensure the grade. If you're branching out into California and Arizona, the um, vendor for leafy greens, so, you know, romaine lettuce, spinach, um, baby lettuce, the vendor must be a signatory of their respective leafy green marketing agreements. If you happen to be shipping Mexican cantaloupe or cilantro, the packer must come from, the grower and packer must be certified by the Mexican authority under the redu reduction of contamination of risks. If you're shipping corn from any state in the United States to Canada, the state of origin must be on an official USDA document. And for other things like um, oranges from Florida, there's actually no additional requirement other than the um, invoice for the goods because there isn't a pest right now in Florida that will attack oranges and then could be transported to Canada to make a happy home here. Um, the requirements for fresh produce it was based on what it is, where it's growing, and where it's destined to. So always keep in mind that there may be additional requirements like a phytosanitary could be required, um, but your local USDA would be able to confirm that for you, as well as your Canadian purchaser. If you are looking to act as a non-resident importer, 
um, or even just an exporter of produce into Canada, it's probably a good idea to be a member, well, sorry, to be an importer, you have to be a member of the Dispute Resolution Corporation. And if you're an exporter, it's probably a good idea to still be a member. You might already be familiar with the organization. Um, the DRC provides, um, fair, provides for fair and ethical trade and consultation and mediation and arbitration services when there's a dispute between the buyer and seller. Um, you can apply to the DRC via fax, um, email, fax, or mail. Next, we have the manufactured food sector. Um, that covers everything that is basically manufactured. It's cookies, crackers, beverages, um, pasta, snacks, and seasonings. Um, those items are more manufactured, so they um, tend to be a little bit less regulated. But the key thing is to know your ingredients. Um, if you happen to be manufacturing something with ingredients from offshore, then um, you may need to check each ingredient to see if it's actually allowed into Canada. Um, it most likely is because Canada and the US have very similar requirements, but it's a good idea to do that double check. Um, just I have an example that it's uh, actually Unfortunately, it's from a Canadian who bought something from offshore. It was uh, hot chocolate packets. And one of the ingredients in the hot chocolate packets, the milk was uh, not allowed into Canada. So they ended up having to uh, destroy that particular hot chocolate. The other thing to watch out for is um, making claims about your food product. Like the FDA, this, uh, Health Canada regulates natural health products based on claims made on the product. So if you're making a claim to cure, treat, diagnose, or prevent a disease or condition, you will then, your food may then fall into the natural health product regulations, which requires the product to be certified by Health Canada, as well as the importer to have an additional license to import those products. And that's to ensure the safety and efficacy of anything that's making claims. And then we have alcoholic beverages. Alcohol, the importation of alcoholic beverages into Canada is highly regulated, um, depend, and it depends on which province or territory they're going to. But in general, they must be imported by a board, commission, officer, or government agency legally, to sell, legally authorized to sell intoxicating liquor in that province. Um, so if you're sending to British Columbia, it's the uh, BC Liquor Board who will actually be performing the importation. They are subject to additional excise duties and taxes at the time of importation. Although if you're shipping bulk spirits or wine to an importer and the importer has a specially issued license, they will be able to import the product and pay the duty as they package it and sell it. Labeling requirements are a bit outside of what a customs broker does because they are so specific to each of the products. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that there are specific labeling requirements and some of the core requirements of those labels. And those are can be a nutrition facts panel, uh, the common name of the product, uh, bilingual labeling, and things like date markings and location and le legibility. So I just went through a whole bunch of commodity specific requirements and each of those commodities also has an HS code that would be associated with those. How do you select the correct HS code? The first thing I'm gonna say is don't open a tariff book and hit control F search. You might find your product or you might find a similar product and it could be the wrong HS code. First thing that you need to understand is that you have to have a detailed description of the product, including what it's made of and its end use. Tariff classification is based on something called the general rules of classification or the general rules of interpretation. And each country has um, international rules and um, their own rules that they have to follow. And those rules point to information in the tariff classification, such as section and chapter notes that give you information about if a product is included in a chapter and if a product is excluded. The customs tariff itself is gigantic. It over, has over 10,000 different tariff classification options. And um, I happen to have a print copy and it's six inches wide. It comes in an index. 
So it's it can be complicated to select the correct HS, but working with someone like a customs broker um, will be able to help you find the correct HS code. There's also options such as writing for customs rulings or binding rulings, and customs will tell you what your HS code will be, and then you have surety on the duty rates and import requirements. So when you're breaking into new markets, sending samples is something that is a great marketing tool. Um, first thing you need to do though with sending samples is check your documentation requirements. One of the things that we run into a lot is someone pops a sample in the mail, they send it with their favorite courier, and then we get a document that says one sample, $0. Um, the first thing is, is with samples is that in a lot of cases, they require the same certifications as larger shipments. So if you're sending, for example, a sample of wine to Canada and it's coming to British Columbia, the BC Liquor Board is still gonna be performing the importation. We need, detailed in, we need a detailed invoice. So what you would issue for a larger sale, we need it for even for that sample. And also customs has rules for valuation and there is no such thing as $0. Everything has a value. It's uh, $1 and zero are red flags. So if you can do your calculation to determine what the um, actual value would be, that would be perfect. And when I say calculation, if you normally sell um, a product at $10 for 100 grams and you're only sending five grams, do the math to reduce that so you know it's only worth, say, 10 cents. And also another caution is for perishable goods, overnight delivery isn't always overnight. Customs clearance may delay your delivery, so ensure your goods are packaged in order to make it to your client in a viable position. Tying in with samples is, especially in COVID, e-commerce. E-commerce has two main methods that it works on. And one is, it's called B2B, business to business. There's two methods that that, one, that, that uh, type of transaction works. The first one is, is when you're selling on a platform and you're selling it to their, or you're not selling it, you're sending it to their fulfillment center in Canada. The fulfillment center won't be a resident, won't be act as the importer of record. Um, they can't because they don't have any financial interest in those goods. So you'll be acting as a non-resident importer and have to meet all of the requirements of Canada. The other option is, is sending it directly to the business in Canada. And then you need to determine who the importer is. Then you have B2C, which is business to consumer. If you're sending to a consumer, so someone who's buying your goods for non-commercial personal in importation, some of the import requirements might be relaxed. Um, importers can import small quantities of good with some of the import requirements reduced because they're considered lower risk. Or if you're electing to make it really easy for your buyers and act as a non-resident importer, those are considered commercial importations and all import requirements are fully enforced. One of the things I get asked a lot about is the release process. So how does this actually work? So first thing is, is the buyer and seller um, negotiate the sale and determine who the importer of record is. The vendor will then prepare the shipment and get the documents ready and the carrier will pick up the shipment. Um, while the shipment's in transit to the border, the carrier will file what their part of the customs documents called the ACIE manifest. And then they send the cargo documents to the customs broker. While the goods are in transport, the customs broker prepares the customs entry and sends it to the CBSA and any participating government agencies that need to review the shipment. The participating government agency will review the information and then return their release decision. They first return it to CBSA. If it's a reject, CBSA sends it back to the start, back to the customs broker, and it goes through the whole process again. Once, the, um, once it goes through the whole process and the participating government agencies um, accept the declaration, CBSA then returns their decision to the customs broker. If as long as it's an accept message, the carrier will proceed to the border and report to the Canada Border Services Agency. Um, at that point, they may decide to examine the shipment. If they do and everything's good, they'll release the shipment. If there's something that's in question, they'll send the question to the customs broker to resolve. Once the shipment's released, the carrier can proceed on their way and to deliver to the consignee, and then the consignee can receive the shipment. So, I know I've gone through a lot of information 
And we also have um, consequences though to non-compliance with those regulations. This is our little pyramid of non-compliance. At the bottom, you have the um, lowest impact which is some shipment delays. You may experience um, increased examinations all the way up to the top to seizures, monetary penalties. And the worst thing that can happen to an importer is they could have their importing privileges revoked for repeated instances of non-compliance. Um, so customs will take steps to let you know you're being non-compliant if you are acting as a non-resident importer and uh, uh, always uh, act, take action on their information and notices that they give you. And now I'm gonna pass this off to Chelsea for shipping and logistics. Okay. Oops. I'm just going to switch to my screen here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how to select your carrier for getting your product into Canada. I'll try to go quickly here. I know we're running short on time. Um, so basically, when we're talking about food and beverage, um, the industry really requires high quality transportation. This includes on-time delivery, excellent communication, and risk management throughout the transit process. Now, uh, more specifically in how to select your carrier, um, might seem a little obvious, but the first question you wanna ask is, does the carrier have Canadian trucking authority? Um, you would be surprised how many times shipments get up to the border and there, you know, it has to get cross docked onto another carrier's equipment. Um, there's a lot of specific steps that the carriers have to take in order to get the trucking authority. In short, um, first they need to apply with the Canadian Border Service Agency to get a CBSA issued carrier code. Um, they would then enroll for the FAST program, which is the free and secure trade. It's very similar to the Nexus program and it allows them to cross the border with accelerated customs and immigration processing. Mm -hmm. Um, then they also need to confirm their registration and insurance requirements. And uh, then they would also need to register for the international registration plan in their state. Um, this is called the IRP vehicle registration. Now, once the carrier actually has the trucking authority, um, a few really important things they need to do are know how to submit their e-manifest. Uh, it's basically an electronic cargo and conveyance data of, of what they're hauling in, um, their, their equipment that's coming into Canada. It's submitted electronically to the CBSA a minimum of one hour before the shipment arrives to the border. They also need to make sure their PAR sticker, which is um, a sticker with that CBSA issued carrier code, is affixed to their bill of lading and their paperwork and also submitted to the broker for CBSA approval. Um, and then, you know, as far as the paperwork goes, they need to first submit their e-manifest, uh, then their BOLs with their PARS codes attached. And then, um, you know, it is one PARS for every shipper. So if your shipment requires four different pickups in the United States, they would need to use four different PARS stickers on every bill of lading from each shipper in order to um, get across the board. Uh, it's extremely important as a supplier to uh, ensure that your carrier and or driver are receiving all of the documents required to cross the Canadian border in order to avoid any delays. And then the kind of a general driver checklist before they cross the border. Uh, the drivers do need to have, um, you know, their valid passport, social security card, their commercial driver's license, their FAST membership card, and uh, be aware of their hours of service. In general, um, between Canada and the United States, the weight and length requirements as well as the hours of service are very similar. Um, so there's not usually a, a huge worry there, but it is important to make sure your shipment will actually be able to get into Canada and it, um, the weight and length of the equipment will match what is legal in Canada as well. Now, one of the biggest considerations uh, everybody's talking about right now is the price of the shipment um, of the, to, tra to transport your shipment. Um, and really price is driven by these four factors. Um, that would be transit time, which is, uh, you know, how quickly do you need your shipment to arrive to the consignee? If you are needing expedited service, it's definitely going to come at a premium cost. Um, 
And then as far as service goes, you know, it, it does the carrier offer um, full visibility tracking of where your shipment is? Do they offer, you know, 24-7, 365 support? Um, or is it a carrier who you can't reach anybody after four o'clock? Um, the size of your product that's being shipped is really important. If you're shipping, you know, just a one to a few pallets versus a full truckload, which would be, you know, upwards of 15 plus pallets. Um, and then being aware of any surcharges that could come up. And this could include like a fuel surcharge, um, residential delivery, power tailgate. There's, there's a lot of different surcharges that can come up. So really having that clear conversation with your carrier is important so you're not getting a surprise cost at the end of the day. And then for as far as services go, um, really evaluate what services does your company require to ship your product. So for example, if you require multiple carriers um, to get your products into Canada, that's going to be a higher cost and a higher time investment overall. Um, it's important to, you know, depending on what your, what your company needs, uh, look for a carrier or logistics provider that can provide multiple services for you so you can get it all done in, in a one-stop shop. Um, and some of those service examples would be things like warehousing, cross-docking, logistics, uh, local distribution, dedicated fleets, and any specialized equipment required. Reliability is another huge consideration. Um, you always wanna look at the carrier's level of service rates. Now, um, on-time delivery is ultimately going to equal a positive reputation for you, uh, business growth, happy customers and consumers. So um, really a, a customer or a carrier that has a good reputation for delivering on time. Um, moving into reputation, does the carrier have a reputation for excellent service? And this could be word of mouth. This can be on social media reviews. Uh, this can be, you know, you just wanna make sure that you do a little research into your carrier and ensure that they do have a good reputation in the industry. And then uh, transparent communication. Um, Shipments that arrive spoiled or late um, equals a, a bad reputation for your company. We have a bit of a catchphrase in the industry and it's you're only as good as your last shipment because really you can go, you can have a hundred loads deliver on time but when you have one that goes really bad, uh, that's going to stay sour in your mouth and you're, you're probably not going to wanna use that carrier moving forward. Um, so having those relationships is, is really important. And then moving into capacity, um, today in this day and age, it's a huge topic right now. We're facing a huge gap in the supply and demand of truck drivers. Uh, this has driven the transportation costs to be at an all-time high. It's, it's, it's brought on a huge cost for shippers and, and customers. Um, and it's more important than ever to choose logistics providers and carriers that have strong relationships with their carriers and drivers. Um, and they have a network that really matches with the lane that your freight travels. It's important to note that there are some carriers that are stronger than others in different regions. For instance, if you're sourcing, uh, you know, a random trucking company from California to move your product to Pennsylvania, and they're not used to delivering in Pennsylvania, they need a backhaul to get their driver back home. Um, you're going to end up paying a higher cost because they're going to charge you more because they don't know what they're going to do once their truck gets to the East Coast. Uh, and then moving into safety, extremely important because not only are your loved ones out on the road dealing with these huge big rigs on the road, but um, safety is really huge in the industry. Um, I've got an example here of two different carriers. You've got your first carrier who provides a really low cost. Uh, but they're known to manipulate their logbooks in order to deliver on time. They have a higher accident rate than the industry average and they have a reputation for unsafe drivers with multiple complaints in their online reviews. And then you've got a second carrier who might have a slightly higher cost, um, but they use their electronic logging devices as required by law. Um, they have an at or below accident rate, the industry average, and their reputation is for delivering on time safely. Uh, obviously carrier number two would be the one to go with here. Um, you never wanna put your freight in, in jeopardy of being damaged in transit intentionally or, um, you know, or going with a company that 
has an, a, a record of um, getting into accidents frequently. And then moving into sustainability, uh, this is becoming more important as the years go on. Um, customers are more inclined to buy from companies that are environmentally conscious. And, you know, so how do carriers provide their environmental sustainability? Um, they can do things by going paperless, um, providing better truck maintenance and more regular truck maintenance on their equipment, um, looking into different kinds of truck technology, uh, driving smarter, so, you know, limiting idling time and things like that, um, sticking to planned routes, and then again, office adjustments. Um, for instance, I worked for a company where we stopped using things like paper cups and everybody had to bring their own mugs, things like that. And uh, if you have any more questions, I, I'm happy to answer those offline as well. Okay, thank you ladies so much. Appreciate that. Um, I felt like that was very informative. We learned a lot um, about logistics to Canada. I know we did have, uh, we're kind of coming close to the end. We have about five minutes left for Q&A. So everyone, if you have any additional questions, please bring them forward. I know we did have one come up. Um, so the question was, how does Canada define country of origin? Is it based on the content of the product or where the product was bottled, packaged, regardless mm -hmm. of its content? So country of origin, um, that I can probably answer this question with three different answers. Um, country of origin, I'll start with just simple repackaging. Country of origin isn't conferred by simply repackaging an item. Um, however, if you are blending it and adding things to it, then you're now making a little bit of a new product then that becomes the final place of production of that good. And then that would make it country of origin, um, using US as an example, US. However, under the uh, USMCA free trade agreement, depending on what's been done to it, it may not meet the rules of the free trade agreement. So it may be some, an article, something that we call um, manufactured in the US or produced in the US, but does not qualify for the free trade agreement. Does that make sense? I hope so. It sounds like it did. <laughs> uh, we had one more that came in. Uh, does every importer need to be NRI non-resident importer? Um, if you are a non-resident, then yes, you have to. You will be an NRI by default. But a company in Canada who's located in Canada, they're just a, they're simply a resident Canadian importer. They're just called it called the importer. Okay, awesome. And if, then, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, if you're shipping goods to Canada, it's not required for you to be a non-resident importer. That's your option. Great, great. And then lastly, um, if there aren't any more questions, I'll ask one more as well. Um, as far as sending exports to Canada during this time, have you found that, like, what's the estimate that you would think it would take logistically to get a product, let's say, from North Carolina to let's go all the way over Toronto. Like, is it is it taking additional time due to COVID or do you find that it's kind of starting to get back on track? Um, I haven't found it to be taking any additional time. I mean, just important considerations depending on how quickly it needs to get there. And, you know, a, a single, a truck driver with one truck in the cab can go about 500 miles a day. Whereas, a, you know, if you order, a, if you want a team to take it in for expedited service, that's two drivers, they can go about a thousand miles in a day. Um, but as long as the paperwork is getting done as quickly as possible, you know, they're submitting their manifests and all their, um, their paperwork. And as soon as they leave the shipper, there shouldn't really be any delays at the border or getting to the consignee. Great, great. Well, thank you, ladies, very much. Uh, if no one else has any questions, uh, we will definitely have this uh, webinar available online on our website before the end of the week. Uh, and you should be receiving an email from the marketing team uh, just saying thank you and appreciate your time. And this was very informative. So appreciate the time, ladies. Thank you. You're welcome. You're Bye, welcome. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.